reden. Uh, Patrick Meyer is not a German, as you might suggest with a name. Um, he's the director of crisis mapping at uh, Ushahidi, and he's the co-founder of the International Network of Crisis Mappers. And um, he's going to talk about the importance of maps in uh, today's world, and also he's going to talk about a new initiative, the Standby Volunteer Task Force. So please welcome Patrick Meyer. Thanks. Cheers. Hello, this is working great. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure to be here. This is such a phenomenal conference. I was following the Twitter feed, and you're tweeting like 100 tweets a minute. It's incredible, really active. So what I'm going to do um, with the next sort of half an hour or so is talk about maps, but not just any kind of maps. I'm, I'm particularly interested in the kinds of maps that combine crowds and clouds to drive social change. But I want to start in the days before the cloud with this story, and in particular 1994. More than 800,000 people were murdered in a very, very short period of time in Rwanda. And the radio, as we all know, Radio Milkolin, played a pivotal role in broadcasting that kind of hate speech, the dehumanization that happened, the demonizing that happened at the time. And Romeo Daler, who was there, um, was told to basically look the other way, right? He had sent a fax to the UN headquarters in New York saying, listen, something is happening here. People are starting to collect weapons. It's looking really bad. I need to intervene. He got a fax back and was told, no, do not intervene. Do not get involved. We don't have the mandate to actually enforce the peace. Now, it turns out that Romeo Dallaire actually disobeyed direct military orders and was able to save about 30,000 people in the process. But let's imagine just for a second that Romeo Dallaire had been on Twitter. What if he'd been on Twitter? What if he'd had 10, 20, 100,000 followers? What if the officers under his command had been on Twitter and were using YouTube and Facebook and what have you to share what was happening? Maybe, just maybe, uh, history would have panned out uh, a little differently. Moving along to 2008, during the post-election violence in Kenya, more than half a million people got forcibly displaced, and some 1,200 people were killed. But I remember I was visiting my parents. I grew up in Kenya, and I was visiting my parents at the time, and I remember the newspaper headlines, Kenya is not burning. Basically, the government, the Kenyan government, was doing all it could to downplay the extent of the violence that was happening. And of course, the mainstream media it just can't be everywhere at the same time, right? There are only a few journalists, and they're not going to be able to document all the human rights abuses that were taking place. So this, however, was the information ecosystem alive at the day, today as well, very different from 1994, not only in terms of the kind of peer-to-peer -peer communication technologies, but they're free, and they're interconnected, meaning I can send out a tweet, that tweet can be reposted on my Facebook wall right away and also posted on my LinkedIn profile. So there's this kind of instantaneous, meshed, horizontal communication that's possible in real time, and, and not just in terms of text-based information, right? We've also been able to share YouTube footage and pictures straight from Twitter and what have you. So it's that interconnected feature of this real ecosystem that I think is, is quite different from what we've seen before, and I think that lends itself to perhaps unpredictable um, results. What was the world's response in Kenya? Well, I actually want to leave the world aside for a second, because when we talk about the world, we often, often really mean the government, the official organizations, the established institutions that have their own political motives and their own agendas. So what did, what did normal, everyday kind of people do when the violence started to flare up in Kenya? Well, some friends of mine, some Kenyan friends of mine, set up the first version, the first map uh, with the Ushahidi platform. And this was really nothing too, um, I think, uh, revolutionary in many ways, because Google Maps had been around for a good three years already. And you can see here on the, the lower side of the screen, what we also did was set up an SMS number, an SMS shortcode that allowed anybody to text that number for free 
in Kenya to report the human rights abuses that they were witnessing. And SMS had been around for years, right? I think the novelty here was the integration, again, of this kind of ecosystem, which provides perhaps a more powerful way to share information. And indeed, what this allowed people to do and what allowed us to do at Ushahidi was in a way to circumvent the Kenyan government, right? And to also overcome the limited capacity that mainstream media has because those journalists could not be in 100 cities at the same time. So we applied this idea of crowdsourcing that we're all familiar with, I think, from Wikipedia to the reporting of crisis information. And this allowed people to document human rights abuses that would otherwise have gone completely undocumented by the government, by human rights organizations, uh, and by other parties. And that's, I think, really um, a different story than what we've seen before. So what we've done with Ushahidi uh, since, basically establish a, an NGO, but not any kind of NGO. We're an African non-profit technology company. So slight hybrids. We're not a Silicon Valley, you know, Western-based software company, and we're not for-profit. We're, we're non-profit. And Ushahidi means witness in Swahili. And what we do is we develop free and open source software that allows people to collaborate in creating live maps of their environment. So real-time collaborative type mapping. And we try and do this using multiple technologies, not just because of what we saw in Kenya, but also what we're seeing more and more around the world, in which Sam just before from Witness uh, was explaining. We see scenes like this. This is already two years old from Tehran during the uh, election protest in Iran. And you see the probability now is increasing that somebody somewhere is going to be able to capture an event, either with a text message, a tweet, an email, YouTube footage, or Flickr. But what we're also seeing now is that more and more people, groups, masses, crowds, are starting to document historical events that are happening in time and space and starting to upload this information uh, on the cloud. So what we want to do with Ushahidi is continue integrating these technologies because once these individuals go ahead and upload to their YouTube account or what have you, it sort of gets a little distributed, it gets a little dispersed. It's like these particles going into the cloud. We want to be able to bring all that evidence right back to one place and we want to use a geographical map because we think that's one of the most intuitive ways to represent real-time information across different media. So we've integrated SMS as part of the Ushahidi platform. We've also integrated email and also Twitter. Our Egyptian colleagues of ours in Cairo integrated Facebook, which means you can post something on a wall and that goes into the Ushahidi backend and then you can map it if there's a geographic component. And we also have a number of different uh, smartphone apps for different smartphones like the Android and, and the iPhone and, and so on. And other people have been using YouTube and Flickr because they've been uploading pictures on these maps as well as video footage and sometimes in near real time. And they use Skype to collaborate all around the world to create these maps. Moving along, 2010 was uh, an a rather disastrous year in many respects. It started very early on in January 12th with a really devastating earthquake that struck Haiti, uh, causing more than 200,000 people to lose their lives. So in this case, you know, what did we do? What was our response? Just everyday average kind of people. Well, as soon as I learned about the earthquake on CNN, a couple hours after it took place, I called David Kobia, who's uh, our technology lead at Ushahidi, and said, David, something bad has just happened. Can you set up this map while I start looking for information to, to map uh, on the Ushahidi map? And within an hour, we were starting to map. And the first sources of information that I had found were on, were on Twitter. I'd found uh, about half a dozen Twitter users in Port-au-Prince who were tweeting live about what was happening and what the impact was. And we continued monitoring these individuals. Some 10 days later, the head of FEMA, now FEMA is the official U.S. Federal Emergency Management Agency, the official U.S. body that's you know, responsible for disaster response. Uh, Craig Fugate, in a, in a public tweet, noted that this map that we just launched was the most comprehensive and up-to-date map available to the entire humanitarian community. And I want to pause there a bit because that's something different I think that's happening here in the humanitarian space. Because it was not FEMA 
that had started this map, let alone was managing the map and adding information to the map, nor was it the United Nations, the World Food Program, UNHCR, what have you, nor was it really any official humanitarian organization. The map started in my living room in a dorm at Tufts University in Boston while it was snowing outside. And a couple days after my colleagues Adu Shahidi and I started mapping, we couldn't keep up anymore because this information ecosystem went into overdrive. User-generated content exploded. The mainstream media was going 24-7. So what I decided to do was just email a bunch of my friends in my uh, grad school program and said, listen, I don't have a plan or anything, but I'm just trying to map Haiti. And if you're around, I could really use your help. So that evening, these first friends showed up, and we just started mapping. By the end of that week, uh, 100 people had showed up at one point in time in my living room just to get trained and then go back to the library or back to their place or Starbucks to continue mapping. And then a week after that, a couple hundred other volunteers showed up, but in, uh, at the university in, uh, in London, at LSE, uh, in Geneva, at the Graduate Institute there, in Toronto, in Washington, D.C., these students and, and non-students, other volunteers, just got together and created their own sort of little situation rooms to help our efforts in, in Haiti. And we were able to do this because of this ecosystem. And, and actually, if you look at this uh, picture, the guy on the left um, is a French guy who was actually listening to radio, uh, French radio. And when he heard of new events or new updates, he would go ahead and map it. So we were drawing from social media, mainstream media, official reports from the UN and humanitarian organizations, television, as well as radio. And we were curating all that content in near real time and mapping it, just putting it on a map. And this is really, in a way, what it looked like at one point. You can see how densely populated this map was. If you look at this number 22, that's actually the number of reports within that particular area. So if you were to zoom in further, you'd see 22 additional individual reports within that particular street corner that had been mapped and, and geo-referenced. So this really was a map like no other. This was no ordinary map. We'd never seen anything like this. The humanitarian community hadn't seen anything like this. We'd never done anything quite like this. But this map changed. It never looked the same for more than 10 minutes. Every 10 to 15 minutes, new information, new data would be curated and geo-referenced. It was a living thing. It was definitely not static. So imagine for just a second if we'd had something like this for Rwanda or other conflicts or other disasters in the past 10, 20, 100 years. I think it's a slightly different world. And there's another reason why you know, I, this is somewhat different. is because by doing this, and again, I don't want to suggest we had any plan. This was an emotional reaction. Saw the news on the TV. I had actually some very close friends of mine in Port-au-Prince. I didn't know whether they were dead or alive and I just felt I needed to do something. Um, so there was no plan. I had never done anything like this before. Uh, but it turns out that a number of first responders, like, like the Marine Corps and the US Coast Guard, actually used our maps. And according to the Marine Corps, they said they used our maps every day and that this helped save hundreds of lives. They were literally taking text messages or emails or what have you from the map and sending out the choppers to go evacuate people. So this was a very, very different way of doing disaster response when you think that you had a bunch of amateur volunteer students in snowy Boston using free and open source software made in Africa to save hundreds of lives thousands of miles away in Haiti. It's completely crazy in many ways. But the real story and the reason any of this was possible really starts with this picture. While a number of the cell phone towers in Haiti, in Port-au-Prince, were affected. Many of the critical ones were repaired very quickly, within a matter of just a few days. So we knew, like in Kenya, that the answer was not going to necessarily be email or, or internet access, right? Uh, but most or many people have own or have access to a cell phone in Haiti. So SMS was going to have to be the answer if we were going to do something that was going to have some impact. And again, while we had that thought, we had no idea whether it was going to work or not. But a day or so after the earthquake, a good friend of mine, Josh Nesbitt, who works for a group called Medic Mobile, sent out a, a tweet. 
and, uh, and just said, okay, I'm looking for an SMS gateway to help out with this uh, Haiti Ushahidi map. What's remarkable with this tweet, and the reason that I, I'm sharing it with you, is within 20 minutes, somebody in Cameroon saw his tweet and tweeted back and told them, listen, uh, I actually know somebody who works for the telecommunications company, the biggest telecommunications company in Port-au-Prince, a company called Digicel. Within that hour, Josh, who was in Washington, D.C. at the time, was on the phone with a contact at Digicel in Port-au-Prince. And by the time he hung up the phone, after half an hour, they had agreed to give us a short code. And this short code was 4636. And the entire SMS operation that took place with this uh, short code became known as Mission 4636, which was spearheaded by another good friend of mine, Robert Monroe. Uh, Robert is a computational uh, linguist at Stanford University. And he got started right away. As soon as Josh let him know about the short code being secured, what we did at Ushadi, we started integrating the short code with the Ushadi platform. But he uh, was smart, uh, well, maybe we weren't thinking, and said, wait, listen, guys, the vast majority if, of text messages, if this is even going to work, are going to be in Haitian Creole. They're not going to be in English. They're, they're going to, some, a small fraction might even be in French, but 99% you know, of them are going to be in Haitian Creole. None of us speak a word of Haitian Creole. So what he did immediately was get on Facebook, because many groups within the Haitian diaspora, which is a very large diaspora in, in the US and, and Canada, started organizing their efforts on Facebook. So he went from Facebook group to Facebook group to Facebook group and said, listen, this is what we're trying to do. We may be getting a flood of text messages which we're going to need to translate. Within a few days, as we went live with the short code and as we started broadcasting this number on local radio stations in Port-au-Prince, Robert was able to uh, recruit 1,200 volunteers from 49 different countries. And this is the location of their ISP addresses. When they logged on to our system to translate these text messages, this is basically their location. It's pretty astounding to think what they did. They actually translated more than 80,000 text messages uh, for free, completely on their own. And the average turnaround time for a text message was 10 minutes. So literally, as soon as a text message left a mobile phone in Port-au-Prince, 10 minutes later, we had it in the Ushadi platform in English. And often it was geo-referenced, because a lot of what these Haitian diaspora volunteers did was also help us find the location, because they obviously know their country a lot better than we do. And this is just a Wordle graphic of the first two weeks of text messages that we received and that were translated. And I think, for me, what's really telling is that I think the second most used word is please. And you can imagine, this is a, a, an incredibly traumatized population. Most of them have lost at least one person they knew, if not an entire family, and they're still saying please. I think that's, that's a huge testament to our humanity. And that's not all. These dots are not just dots. Right? They're real people, just like you and I. They're people that have their jobs, that go to conferences, that go to school, that have their own worries and concerns and, and loved ones and so on, but they still took the time to help people who they would never meet thousands of miles away by just translating, by offering their time to translate about 10 novels worth of text messages. Uh, I'll, let, I'll let all of them know you applauded. Thank you. Um, 2011, it was not much quieter, as you know. Devastating earthquake in, in Japan with the tsunami that resulted caused a lot of um, havoc and uh, destruction. But within a few hours, some friends of ours in uh, Tokyo decided to launch uh, a live map of Japan. They had seen what had happened in Haiti. So this kind of learning that's starting to take place now. And started mapping. Again, not necessarily with a plan per se, but they saw what happened in Haiti. Like, okay, we, we might as well try this out. And uh, now this is a very different context, right, than, than Haiti. Here you have a society that's incredibly connected, incredibly technology savvy, very media rich. So the vast majority of um, information that ended up being and still is being mapped comes from Twitter. Uh, from people monitoring the Twitter feed. And again, just to drive the point home, 
the group behind this initiative was not the Japanese emergency management national, what have you, right? It was not the pros, not the people who are paid to do this. Just a bunch of volunteers who got together, eventually found a, a space in downtown Tokyo to do this in, in, in one room. And in fact, I just heard uh, a couple of days ago, I was in touch with the, the team, that um, one of their volunteers is 13 years old. There's this 13 year old Japanese kid who's, who's called a super coder. Apparently, he's like a massive hacker who, who went in and, and, and started to help with the software development as well. So it's incredible the kinds of people that come together that otherwise would not come together in, this time, in these types of crises and disasters. And again, you can see just how densely populated. We mapped about 3,000 individual reports in Haiti uh, throughout a two-month period. They mapped 3,000 in one week. They've mapped more than 10,000 reports now. And because they have the most comprehensive, live, up-to-date map um, in Japan, the government, as well as foreign embassies, um, are actually Western embassies, are, are using this map to inform what's happening, to, to get more information, to get more situational awareness about what's happening um, in Japan. There's another completely different type of crisis now, as you know, also unfolding, uh, unfortunately, still in, in Libya. And unlike Haiti, what we saw in Libya was somewhat different in terms of the response, because immediately the UN, which was an organization that was a little skeptical to be honest, um, during and after Haiti, about crowdsourcing, about social media. For them, it's a, just, it's a new territory, so th they're not quite sure to what to make of it. But a year later, on the official UN Twitter feed, they said, hey, look, this is how social media can actually help. And what happened was on March 1st this year, uh, the head of the information management unit at OCHA, so OCHA is the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, so the main UN body that's in charge of coordinating humanitarian response uh, across UN agencies and also across the humanitarian community. The head of their information management team emailed us and said, okay, listen, the situation is pretty bad, we know that, but we really don't know exactly what's happening in Libya. For us, it's just a black box. Why? Well, because the United Nations has not had any personnel that's been stationed in Libya. They don't have any information management officers in Tripoli or in Benghazi or what have you and they don't want to rely on government propaganda, and there are no alternative official sources of information that are independent. But they knew, seeing what happened in Haiti and, and after, that there was probably a lot of information coming out of the social media space, namely on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Flickr. So they asked us, you know, can you create a live map? Because we need to start planning our humanitarian relief operations yesterday. We need to start allocating funding and resources and defining what our strategy is going to be. Where should we be expecting the refugee flows and so on? So within a couple hours, we started mapping and creating this, this live map. And even the executive director of the World Food Program, uh, Jose Chirin, mentioned in this public tweet that, yeah, they can actually use this crowdsourced social media map uh, to allocate food uh, supplies along the Egyptian and uh, Tunisian corridors. So a really different world in, in many respects, and again, seeing how densely populated it very quickly got. And the UN OCHA, but the World Food Program, UNHCR, the Red Cross, and a number of other humanitarian organizations were using this visualization to basically analyze the situation. Now I'm going to ask a familiar question. Who was behind this initiative? You know it was not the UN, you know it was not FEMA. It was a group called the Standby Volunteer Task Force. Now, this is a network of individuals that a few friends of mine and I launched uh, just a few months ago because we saw what happened in Haiti. People just came out of nowhere to help out. I mean, you saw those 49 different countries. And uh, we saw that after Haiti, when the earthquake in Chile happened, people came back. Some of the same volunteers came back and wanted to help again. And new volunteers came back because this time it was Chile, it was South America. Maybe they were from South America and they wanted to help. And then we saw during the massive floods in Pakistan, some of the same volunteers who had helped out in Haiti and in Chile come back with new volunteers from Southeast Asia coming on board to help out. And the same thing happened with the Russian fires and so on and so forth. So we figured, wow, there's really something special here, uh, something that maybe we haven't really seen before. Why don't we just give this network of people um, a name. Let's give them a brand. Uh, let's give them a face. So we decided to launch this Standby Volunteer Task Force. 
And we now have more than uh, 500 volunteers in more than 50 different countries around the world who have become trained and skilled in doing live crisis mapping operations. That's something that, again, we haven't seen. And it was this team that we activated within an hour or two after the request from OCHA to basically create a live map of Libya. And I want to just say a few words about the word volunteer, because I think the word volunteer tends to come with a negative connotation sometimes. You know, you know you're a volunteer, you're, you're amateurish, and you're not really reliable, you're a skateboarder or something, you know, that kind of like prejudice that happens. These volunteers are self-selected. They're the ones who decide to join because they want to, because they feel they want to make a difference, because it means something to them. And many of these volunteers are skilled professionals. So I'll give you just a few examples, just in terms of who is part of this task force. We have uh, one person from Iceland who's had 16 years of experience in leading search and rescue teams around the world. Um, we have uh, another chap who toured with uh, Sarman and Garfunkel in the 1980s, and he's helping out. We have an undergraduate student in Toronto who is a theater student who spends her evenings and the weekends helping out in, in, mapping, in mapping Libya. And there's even a doctor in Samoa, and there's an emergency um, airside manager at Heathrow International Airport who basically, after the last planes take off from Heathrow Airport around midnight, he jumps in Skype and he jumps in the crisis map just to help out. And the oldest volunteer that recently joined is 85 years old, which proves that it's never too late to join and try and make a difference in the world just from your own laptop. So I bet you're wondering, how can you become a crisis mapper, right? Um, well, I have an answer for you. Simply send us an email at join at standbytaskforce.com. And there's really no obligation. That's really not our style. What our goal is, is to train people in how to do live uh, crisis mapping operations. We've got modular team structures, we've got workflows, it's all pretty uh, self-explanatory. We've got a dedicated website, a social networking group uh, to coordinate, and, and we're on Skype as well. So there's no obligation. If you just want to get trained on how to do live crisis mapping, simply drop us a note. And just to let you know that the UN, OCHA, and Geneva, and other groups are also coming to us and joining the task force because they want to get trained in, in how to do this. So um, love to have you on the team. OK. We've, we've talked about disasters, crises, and so on, but of course, we can't ignore the fact that uh, there have been a few revolutions in uh, the Arab world over the past few months. We saw that the protests in Cairo and across Egypt, Alexandria and other cities, brought millions of people to the streets. And as one Egyptian activist noted, that she said, you know, we use Facebook to schedule our protests, and then we use Twitter to coordinate them, and then we use YouTube to tell the world about it. So there's, as you know full well, uh, more and more of a reflex around the world uh, with respect to getting on Twitter, getting on these social media tools, and sharing information and coordinating. But there's another reflex that we've seen starting to surface over the past couple of years, and that's the mapping. So as soon as the internet was back online in, in Egypt, uh, an Egyptian group set up uh, a new Shahidi map. And if your eyes are better than mine, you'll see the URL, the domain name is forward slash CR. CR stands for civil resistance. This group had every intention to use this map, not only to coordinate their efforts and the protests, but also to map the crackdown by the Mubarak regime, the, the, the violence that the thugs were actually committing. And one important feature of the Ushidi platform that sort of helps with that, and it's all in Arabic, but you'll have to trust me on this. What you can do is you can subscribe to alerts. So you can go on that map and you can point the cursor to maybe wherever your neighborhood is, define the radius of area of interest. Um, and as soon as something gets mapped within that particular surface area, you get an automated email uh, and or an automated text message. This idea of providing you with, with real-time situational awareness about what's happening, when it's happening, and importantly, in real space, meaning exactly where that particular event is happening. And that helps to close the feedback loop. It allows you to perhaps have more information and hopefully make more informed decisions about what to do when you get that information. Ironically, though, I think that one of the most important pieces of information that was circulated in the lead-up to the revolution in, in Egypt was on a 26-page 20 PDF document. Hundreds, if not thousands, of copies 
of this document were circulated in both uh, Cairo and Alexandria. And this goes back to the basics. This was simply a very, very well-written strategy guide on how to coordinate um, and strategize civil resistance down to the tactical level. It's incredibly well written. People who wrote this, I don't know who, knew exactly what they were talking about. What's equally interesting is that a lot of this guide talked about movement, about how to move around in the streets, how to recruit. You start in the small alleyways, right? Because you build more momentum, you build more energy, and then you flood into the avenues all together. You don't just show up in Tahrir Square for the heck of it. There is really in a way, a science behind civil resistance. It's purposeful, it's deliberate, it's planned, it's calculated. And this civil resistance in Egypt was one of the most disciplined, well-carried-out and well-executed civil resistance movements that I've seen in a long time. And they went so far as to including screenshots from Google Earth of downtown Cairo in this 26-page in this um, guide, uh, outlining you know, where to move, that maybe these areas you might get ambushed and so on, and just trying to provide some uh, informative uh, guidance on, on, where, on where to go and where not to go. Now, this was all in a PDF document, so this is all, all static. But there's no reason this needs to be static, right? And this is a great quote from a, a U.S. chief security officer in the U.S. who's incredibly pissed off about these real-time maps. He's just incredibly fed up. He's annoyed. He's had it. He's saying, basically, for crying out loud, these real-time maps are basically as good as having your own helicopter. And now these bloody activists own these helicopters. And that's not OK. He's really annoyed. And you see the hype in there. And he goes as far as saying, you know, these real-time maps are maybe even better than a helicopter if you can distract the crew. And what he means by that, and what he's worried about, and rightfully so, what if some activists set up a map and start mapping that they are headed to the palace, to the presidential palace, what have you, when in fact they're legging it the other way and headed to the, pre to the parliament? Right? You can start doing deception with this kind of civil resistance. So we thought to ourselves, that's pretty neat. How can we, how can we help out in this kind of helicopter building? And we figured we don't want to just give activists any kind of helicopter. We want to give activists the best kind of helicopter that they can possibly use. Right? Let's really piss people off. Um, so we started thinking, and with the help of others, this was not just our idea, we put two and two together, and I think you're all familiar perhaps with Foursquare or Gowalla, and even Facebook now, you have this check-ins idea, right? So with Foursquare, it's all very entertaining, and it's fun because you can network, you can connect, you can check in to Berlin and become the mayor of Berlin and have a badge and 10 points, and you find out that 17 of your friends are in the pub next door or what have you. So it's really neat to connect people, and it's fun, it's engaging. We figured, why can't we take this basic idea and, and apply it to uh, other, for, for other purposes? So, we just launched um, Ushahidi check-ins, uh, we call it CI for short, for check-ins, at South by Southwest just recently. So it's still very, very um, early in terms of the development of Ushahidi CI. But this is what it sort of looks like. And um, I actually set one up last night for uh, this conference. So this is what it looks like. If you get on your uh, iPhone and download the app, you can go to Republica and then what I did last night, let's see if this works. Uh, just a quick instant message, right, saying, hey, I'm, I'm Republica, I'm really excited, and then you'll see that um, within 30, 20, 10 seconds, it's, it's posted there. And so what we're doing with this kind of check-ins idea is we're looking at this idea of instant messaging, but applied to mapping. So check-ins is like instant mapping. It's like sort of one-click mapping, letting the world or whoever you want to know um, know about where you are. And we also figured, you know, why should there only be one Foursquare company or one Goala company? These companies are for profit, nothing wrong with that, but it's proprietary software. So you can't have really your own Foursquare. So the check-ins that we're developing, and that's already available, is free and open source. There's no reason why you can't have your own Foursquare company. I mean, I know it's really disruptive, but that's what we do. Um, so you can set up your own check-in system for Boy Scouts, or your company, or you, know, you name it. There's so many different applications. So if you want to play around with this, all you have to do is you go to download.ushahidi.com, and you'll see you can download a number of different mobile uh, apps uh, for the iPhone, the Android, the Windows Mobile, and some Java apps as well. And there's a BlackBerry will come, come in later this year. And then all you have to do when you open your app is point it to 
rp11.crowdmap.com. And you can check in right now and mess around with it, or you can go home and create your own check-ins. And the way you would do that is you go to crowdmap.com. I didn't mention CrowdMap before, but really all CrowdMap is is the Ushahidi platform, but in the cloud. It's a hosted version of the Ushahidi platform. So CrowdMap is like the Google Docs of Ushahidi. You don't have to download anything. It's just in the, in the cloud. You just start mapping in a minute. You sync it with your smartphone app, and, and you're on your way. The good friends of ours did something even better uh, in London during the student protest recently. They developed a danger compass. Um, and so the red points to where the cops are, so you don't want to go in that direction. And the green is the safe way out, uh, because the cops have this tactic of basically circling the, the protesters and, and basically holding them hostage. Um, so we're hoping to do something like this. I think it's a phenomenal idea. It's very intuitive and allows people to, to coordinate very quickly. So what's next? Well, what we've seen over the past uh, oops, six weeks, or not six weeks, 60 weeks or so, is more than 6,000 maps, live maps, uh, using the Ushidi technology. Uh, launched in more than 40 different countries for basically, I mean, almost as many different reasons. We've seen election monitoring, environmental monitoring, human rights, you, you name it. You've got an idea and it can be mapped. It's, it's, it's probably something that you can do or that's already been done before. And this Russian friend of mine had a, made a good comment in a recent blog post that you know, if radio gave each event a sound and TV gave an image, then this mapping reflex that we're seeing now is sort of giving every event a geographic location. It's almost, in a way, closing the circle of senses that we would want to have. And just to make sure you don't think I'm Mr. Despair, Gloom, Depressed, uh, Violence, Disasters, and so on, the Ushi platform can be used to map whatever you want. So this chap decided that he likes burgers, and he wants to create a burger map of the United States to find out where the best burgers are. And I guarantee you that he didn't map all these 400 spots. A couple other hundred people who decided, yeah, I want to I have my, my say. I want to I say where, where the best burger is. So it's a very similar dynamic that we see in Wikipedia, right? Why do people get on Wikipedia and create articles? You know, 27 million pages worth. People want to have a voice. They want to generate content. They want to share. And we're seeing this kind of dynamic and reflex now increasingly happening with maps. So speaking of food, I uh, just have a few more slides. Um, I want to talk about the idea of crowd feeding. We've talked a lot about crowd sourcing, but, but crowd feeding is really important. And what crowd feeding is, is basically what you see on this in the categories section. This was the first Ushahidi map that decided to divide the categories between uh, problems and solutions. And that's really, I think, a very pivotal uh, evolution, if you'd like, in how we use these maps. Because clearly in a disaster, in a crisis, and this was during one of the worst snowstorms in Washington, D.C., completely paralyzed the city, nothing was moving, the, uh, the official responders were completely over, uh, over capacity. Um, so we know that in a disaster we're not affected, we're not equally vulnerable, right? For political, social, economic, historical reasons, different communities, different populations have different levels of vulnerability. So those who are more vulnerable and who are more affected, can we be sent out a text message and say, I need help? And the part of this society that is less affected can help, can offer help, and usually wants to offer help, right? So if we provide this kind of solutions and problems, we can crowdsource the problems, but we can maybe also crowdsource the solutions, especially if we can start connecting and matching solutions and problems, like having a match.com, if you'd like, not dating, but for disaster response, to connect people. And I think this will really be one of the keys to building more resilient societies, because disaster responders cannot be everywhere at the same time, just like the journalists in Kenya cannot be everywhere at the same time. But the crowd is always there. Your neighbor is always there. So why not draw on this? Because by definition, the first responders in a disaster are the disaster-affected population. And this has since been used in Russia during the massive forest fires. This was the largest crowdsourcing exercise ever carried out in Russia. This was just at the beginning. That's why you don't see that many events. But this volunteer group, again, set up a call center because elderly people were not going online, and they were doing the matching via call center. And it showed very, very clearly, in a way, um, the, the limitation of Russian uh, statehood. It showed that the Russian government was definitely not in control and did not, was not on par in, a, in being able to provide this kind of uh, response. So, last couple slides. We've talked about technology, and I think I've 
you know, I'm excited about technology for sure, but I, I want to I be very clear that technology is at most 10% of the solution. At least that's what we believe and that's what we say at Ushahidi. Right? The technology is the easy bit. You know, now setting up a crowd map, setting up a check-in system is easy. It's the other stuff, it's the other 90% that's difficult and that we, we just better not forget or ignore. Right? I promise you that downloading the Ushahidi platform will not automatically give you a staff, training, funding, a media strategy, an outreach strategy, um, an evaluation framework, I mean, you name it. All that stuff is the other human stuff, if you'd like, which is the important stuff that needs to happen in order for that 10% to really make a difference. If that 90% is not there, you know, we've just scored a 10% on our final exam, and that's definitely a, a big fail. So technology is exciting and so on, but you have to first focus on people, then process, and then the technology. Okay, last, last slide for real this time, and, and then I'd love to take your questions. I just wanted to end on, on a, perhaps a more personal note in terms of what all this means to me um, by paraphrasing a, a good friend of mine who works for the New York Times. And he wrote recently in a, in a really great op-ed, you know, they say that history is written by the victors. But now, today, unlike 1994, before the victors win, and indeed if they win, there is a chance to scream out with a text message, a text message that will not vanish, and a text message that will in fact remain immortalized on a map for the world to bear witness. So what would we know about what passed between the Turks and the Armenians, the Germans and the Jews, the Hutus and Tutsis, if every one of them had had the chance before the darkness to declare for all time, I was here and this is what happened to me. Thank you very much. Great speech, thank you. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Patrick, for uh, your very enthusiastic um, uh, talk. And I was particularly intrigued what you said about um, using uh, mapping during protests, really, and the minute where it was uh, happening. But on the other hand, I was wondering, isn't this also extremely vulnerable to do agent provocateur and to um, you, you, you gave the example that activists could obfuscate their actions, but just as well uh, could, could the state mislead the activists mm -hmm. in, at much less risk uh, than if they have to go on the ground. So uh, do you have some kind of solution or way to go there? That's a, a really, really important question. Thank you very much um, for, for posing it. Um, technology can be used for good and ill. I think the way that we use technology in, in a way just reflects our values as human beings. It reflects how we think and how we feel about life sometimes. And there's absolutely no doubt, and we've seen this, and this is not new in terms of social media, but repressive regimes have been using technology for many, many years, decades, to, to repress, to basically have that advantage. And I'll, I'll, um, I'll give you a couple sort of uh, examples as, as perhaps answers, and let me know if I, if I don't completely answer your question, but um, first of all, the Libya crisis map, the one that you saw there, that's the public version of the crisis map. There is a password protected version. The public version is on a 24-hour time delay, and it's also redacted. You don't get the full description, you just get the title. Um, and that's in part because we realize that, yes, you can give the UN better situational awareness, with this live map, but heck, you can give Qaddafi forces better situational awareness. So what we did is we, we the, the site that the UN and other humanitarian organizations were using was a password protected site, which had more content and that was live uh, for that particular purpose. Um, whether that's enough, I honestly, I, I don't know. Uh, what's really, in a way, ironic is that it's the UN that wanted this public version. We were not going to make it public. And then within like three or four days, they said, we need to make some of this public. Um, and, and so we did. Um, I'll give you uh, another example that's, that's not particularly fun. But clearly, 
these regimes are becoming more sophisticated than not becoming stupider. So, you know, we saw what happened in, in Tunisia. It, according to some of the uh, Tunisian activists like Sami Garbia, it was a Facebook revolution. We saw what happened in, e in Egypt as well. Well, what do you think happened in the Sudan? Well, what happened was a few days before the Sudanese activists themselves decided, hey, we want to go pro protest uh, as well. We want the world to see what, what's happening in Sudan. A Facebook group appeared. And this Facebook group said, hey, join the protest down in Khartoum in the square at 2 o'clock on January 30th. So all of these, these activists um, got together. They got really excited. They saw what happened. You know, Mubarak fell, Ben Ali fell. They show up to the square, and it turns out it was the Bashir government that had set up that Facebook group. They got arrested, they got tortured, they got beaten, they got their passwords for their Skype, Facebook, emails, all taken. So, I mean, yes, the answer is it's incredibly dangerous, um, and we have to be very careful. So one of the things we've done, if you, we have a blog with a standby volunteer task force, um, and we've basically written up all this lessons learned and best practices and gotten other people who are more experts than we are to chime in and help us develop this, we called it security and ethics of live mapping in hostile environments. So if, if you can add to that blog post, that'd be really helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Well, um, actually, I also would like to um, address a problem. I, I also very much like the, the project that, that you've uh, presented. Um, I just wonder, you know, like you've, for example, described um, all these, um, well, branches popping up, uh, people, you know, um, organizing um, sit-ins to um, feed, feed, feed the maps with data, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. short training, uh, some instructions, and then you go in. Um, in in, in a, such a serious, serious situation like a crisis, um, I just wonder, you know, about the filter problem. The, the ver verification of data, you say, you know, you're like kind of like looking all of, for all kinds of sources, etc., mass media, social networks, etc., and you're working with all these volunteers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the classical problem of, I think, all, all sorts of like, you know, crowdsourced uh, projects that deal with uh, intelli intelligent or uh, data, and, and you've, you've mentioned, um, you've mentioned, um, or you, you've described your project as some kind of like, um, well, Wikipedia version for the maps or something, and we see you in Wikipedia the edit wars. So that would be like kind of the point that I'm sort of hinting at, you know, like who's, who's sort of like in charge of, you know, like kind of like, you know, taking the responsibility of, you know, f sort of like, yeah, viable yeah, so data or not. Right, no, that's a, another incredibly important question. Um, How do you deal with that? Yeah. So, so uh, first of all, just, uh, so the Ushahidi, the group, the company, doesn't, we don't get involved in 99% of these maps, right? It's other people around the world. And when you download your Ushahidi platform or your crowd map or what have you, you are the moderator. Your group, your organization, your volunteers, who, you, know, you decide what gets published or not. So all the content that gets published on a map, on an Ushahidi map, is first, has first got to be moderated. It's first got to be approved. So if you don't, think that uh, information you received is accurate or what have you, you don't, have to make it, you don't have to make it public. In terms of how you validate this information, there are, I think, different ways. It's clearly a challenge. Um, first thing I'd say, though, is not to necessarily confuse um, Ushahidi with crowdsourcing. Um, for example, what the UN is doing now in Libya, they have their own SMS numbers for Libya, Egypt, and Tunisia, and their staff are texting in information. So that's more trusted content, it's the professionals, right? Al Jazeera did the same thing a few years back in Gaza. There are journalists who were in Gaza who were texting and tweeting live to the map. So it doesn't have to be open. That's the first, that's the first answer. If it is open, I think there are a couple ways that you can go about um, verifying and validating. One is what the Egyptians did in November and December when they used the Ushahidi platform for monitoring the parliamentary elections, a project that they called Ushahid. Uh, as you may remember, Mubarak didn't allow any international observers to come in. So this Egyptian group said, you know, screw that, we're going to do it ourselves then. And um, what they did is they worked with a, a seasoned professional journalist from the Thomson Reuters Foundation who'd had 20 years of experience, and she's the one who said, all right, this is how we verify information in journalism. And we should remember that journalists, the good ones, are very good at doing this. This is what journalists do very well, the good ones, right? They filter, they validate, they follow up, they have sources, they triangulate, and so on. So she developed those guidelines, which you uh, can probably get still on their website. Uh, you know, if there are three different independent reports on SMS from three different numbers describing the same event, then you can assume perhaps you have three, three um, 
uh, witnesses. Now, that's not a guarantee. Uh, I'd be the first to admit that. Um, she also, I think, said, once we have two pictures about the same event, we'll mark it as, as, as um, uh, verified, and also video footage. And they were able to verify 91% of about 3,000 reports that were crowdsourced using these methods. And following up, by the way, there was a lot of follow-up. Because once you get somebody to send you information by tweet or SMS, you can call them right back up and get more information, put them on the spot and say, yeah, did this really happen? Or you have, I mean, it was a massive network of bloggers who were also going out in the streets and verifying. Um, I'll um, end with two quick other points. Um, one is uh, something I, it was just in Kyrgyzstan, and what they did during the uh, violence in the South last year is this uh, woman who heads a, an NGO uh, got on Skype and started a Skype group with her friends just to start talking about what was happening. Within two hours, 2,000 people across Kyrgyzstan had jumped the Skype group, joined the Skype group, and they were verifying, verifying information in real time. They were filtering it, and then when they found out, because there were rumors on text message, there was rumor that the Uzbek army was invading from the south. So one of the people on Skype said, I have a friend who works in the border, I'll ask him. The guy's like, takes a picture, there's nothing here, there are no armies. And then they got the word out by the media and by broadcast SMS, saying, people, this is completely false. So it's not impossible, it is a challenge because of the, the real-time aspect of it. And the last thing I'll say is, look up Swift River. Swift River is another project from Ushahidi. It's a project, right? Sorry? It's, it combines human creation with automated and natural language processing to cluster events and triangulate and create probability scores. What is the probability that this event happened given you have seven text messages, two tweets, one video, and one article from BBC News? But I want to take, can I take one more picture, uh, question? Because uh, she was waiting. Question. Sorry? I was going to ask about Swift River because uh, we had uh, Victor Miklowicz here last year who spoke about Swift River okay. and introduced it as the first idea. So I was actually just going to ask precisely that question, how developments on that project are proceeding. It's going better now than it was. It took a while to get to this stage. So the, last, the latest developments that have happened over the last two or three months, now I'm more compelled to use it, to be completely frank and honest. Uh, it wasn't quite there yet, but now you have the clustering uh, mechanism, you have the filtering mechanism. Uh, it allows you to, you know, every time you get a, you decide what sources you want to follow, by the way. Um, you just decide which sources you want to follow, and then Swift River pushes those reports to you, and whichever report, you can, dis you can vote on the report and say, yes, this is relevant or irrelevant, yes, this is accurate, or I know that this is inaccurate. And the algorithm basically learns and says, oh, clearly this person doesn't think this Twitter user is accurate, so I'm not going to push this anymore. Uh, but this user is interested in this kind of information with these kinds of keywords, so I'm going to give her or him more of that information. And you can start within, you know, it depends on how much information is coming in, but we did this for Libya, and the UN used it for Libya. Within about an hour and a half, we had a pretty neat stream of filtered, uh, relevant, and uh, content that could be considered more reliable. So uh, it's free and open source, so if you have feedback on it and how we can improve it, please, please get in touch. Patrick Meyer, ladies Thank and gentlemen. Thank you Thank so you. much.